Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in um, on this subject, which um, is something rarely discussed. And I hope to make a presentation that will be enlightening to everyone who is attending. Equine-assisted rehabilitation for breast cancer patients. Um, one might assume that before you could do equine-assisted rehabilitation, the breast cancer patient would no longer be a patient. They would have received all of their treatment, they would be back on their feet, they would be functioning. But I am talking about rehabilitation before, during, and after the traumatic experience of breast cancer and hopefully its survival. The way this presentation is constructed, this slideshow, which will be posted on the website uh, to be viewed later, is as an outline on a how to do it. I'm assuming that there are people attending this webinar who have the facilities, who have the horses, who have the volunteers, who have the desire to reach out to the breast cancer community and offer something that to my knowledge does not exist as yet anywhere. I have tried to find other centers that are providing targeted therapy to breast cancer patients. I have heard of a few startups, one in Pennsylvania which is no longer open. There was an attempt at beginning something like it in Israel and I corresponded with the lady there who was a survivor who wanted to have this available, but uh, I'm not sure if that continued. Um, so the way this is set up is if you want to do this, this presentation is designed to show you how it can be done and why it should be done this way, in my opinion. This is how I have done it. I'll tell you a little bit about myself while others sign on. Um, I have been an R instructor for about 15 years and um, uh, I'm a breast cancer survivor. Uh, my surgery was in 2007. And uh, the treatment that I received uh, did not go very well. It left me disabled and on hospice with uh, six months uh, to live. So I had my horses and I had my program, which I had to close. And um, I didn't really know what to do because after all the treatment, I was basically um, terminal. And so I began doing um, some form of what you might call hippotherapy for myself with a little pony and discovered some amazing results that I never dreamed possible. Although I'd been doing this for years and I'd seen uh, uh, wonderful things happen with um, children who couldn't speak, children who were blind. Um, I had no idea of the power of this until I felt it myself. So that's a little bit about who I am and how I came to this. And now I'm going to talk to you about the issues, um, the issues that I think that are involved, which are not only physical, but they are psychological. This is a very emotional subject. It's a subject that there gets a lot of publicity in terms of fundraising and uh, walk, you know, 60 mile walks and that kind of thing. But very little is discussed on about what happens to the breast cancer patient after the medical establishment finishes with the standard treatments, which are surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and then uh, many years of anti-estrogen hormone treatment, which has also very severe effects uh, on the body. So that's the background. That's what best breast cancer is, and it was for me. And now, if we're ready, Jenny, do you think we're ready to begin with the slides, or shall we wait a little bit longer? I don't hear Jenny. Yes, go for it. Okay. So let's begin. Now I am assuming that some of the people watching this will be able to actually expedite this. But um, I'm starting out by pointing out we know about 
that, that horses are prey animals. We know that their first instinct is flight when they are afraid. And um, we know that we humans, we, those of us who are horse people, are predators and can be seen as predators by the horse. <clears throat> and so we need to conduct ourselves in a way to inspire trust and confidence in the horse and to have that for ourselves. However, someone who is not a horse person and who has experienced the breast cancer journey is traumatized. And one of the symptoms of trauma is fear and a loss of confidence. Uh, we know those of us who work with horses, professionals in the equestrian therapy field, equine therapy field, um, that we must uh, enable the horse to overcome its natural first instinct, which is fear, and so that they can then provide us the strength of their bodies um, for rehabilitation for all kinds of disabilities for, for children and adults. Now, in terms of severe disability, the mode of therapy is generally hippotherapy, and hippotherapy is generally provided for children. What I did for myself was a form of hippotherapy for myself, which had a dramatic effect on my healing, my ability to heal and revive myself. And um, that involved my getting in touch with the horse's heartbeat and breathing. So we'll go on to the next slide. The purpose is to demonstrate the principles and methods of rehabilitation for recovering breast cancer patients. And that means that could include women who are still involved in their chemotherapy or women who are still involved in their radiation therapy or women who have had their mastectomies, uh, their surgeries, their scars are healed to the point where they could come in contact with the horse or women who have totally recovered, not that I think that there is ever total recovery, certainly not em emotionally, but because I think that breast cancer and uh, the experience of the treatment is traumatic. And I'd like to say that I think that the, s the same PTSD that we use in reference to um, veterans whose bodies have been altered as well as their spirits who have been traumatized um, apply in many cases to women after breast cancer. And I'd like to quote uh, Dr. Paul Spears, who earlier this year gave a presentation on post-traumatic stress disorder, its symptoms and its treatment, and how a program can be started for handling um, wounded warriors. And he said, I asked him, uh, if you think that you can apply PTSD to breast cancer, and his, his remark was, I quote, PTSD applies to any life-threatening trauma, and breast cancer is certainly that. So I'm uh, take, take, making an assumption that post-traumatic stress is often an after-effect of the trauma of breast cancer and its treatment. And I'm uh, making an assumption, or I'm concluding, that the ways of dealing with PTSD in clinical therapy or equine facilitated therapy can similarly be useful in rehabilitating the often devastated life of the breast cancer survivor. And I think as horses are being used to treat the symptoms of PTSD for wounded warriors, um, those symptoms, uh, two of which are fear and anxiety, as well as feeling alienated from the civilian world, can also be characteristic um, of this type of PTSD for the breast cancer survivor. And I think for women, um, the feeling of alienation and the need to feel whole again are definitely issues. Um, alienation from the norm of society with its emphasis on breasts, as we all know, if we're women, as a necessary female attribute, and the alienation felt when the breasts are removed. And along with that is discomfort with the body, embarrassment, and uh, as well as damage to the body from treatment of chemotherapy, the loss of hair, 
and of radiation, uh, both of these uh, treatments definitely alter the body and the mind. So where does the horse come in? Uh, as we all know, in dealing with uh, disabled people or people who are impaired in various ways, that the horse does not care about how you look. The acceptance of the horse, regardless of the condition of our bodies, is the key to beginning to accept ourselves in a new normal. And that is a new normal that we are going to have to adjust to after this disease and its treatment. And uh, I'm also stating that it is not only comforting to work with the horse, but it is actually energizing. It provides a kind of release of tension for the client that is relaxing. And as well as relaxing, it can be healing. And oddly enough, uh, what I'm going to show you is not an easy thing for the horse to do. But afterwards, the horse is also relaxed by the kind of trust that this requires rather than domination that is used often in terms of a horse being made to perform. So those, those are my um, introductory, uh, introductory remarks about where we're going. Now we're going on a journey on how this can be done. And I'm making some assumptions, the first part. Uh, I'm going to talk about what you need to know about a breast cancer patient, what you need to know about the kind of horse you need to use, how you should prepare, and the four steps that I have established, the four principles that I've used, and the methods that I use in, in executing them. And then I'm going to talk about the sequence of sessions. If you were to set this up for a month, uh, four sessions, how you would go stage by stage and the last part is the bonding part, where a bond actually happens between the horse and the, and the breast cancer survivor. And part five will be precautions, because there are many conditions that you need to be aware of in the survivor of breast cancer before you do this or as you do this. So let's proceed. I hope everybody's it, signed up. Can you all see the picture of this lady? Uh, no matter how she may look when she comes, appears to you dressed with her wig on or if her hair is grown back, underneath that is this kind of fear, this kind of mentality. Now we call ourselves predators in relationship to the horse, the prey animal who has every reason to fear us. But I think what you're looking at here in this picture is not a predator, but someone who feels alone, isolated, victimized, and probably ashamed of her body. So we're assuming that the breast cancer patient needs physical and emotional revitalization, that what she has been through has not only been mind-numbing, as chemotherapy is known to do, they call it chemo brain, uh, but emotionally numb. Her vital functions have been impaired. Her self-image has been impacted by surgery and treatment, and she may be, and probably is, as this picture would indicate, tactically defensive. And those of you who uh, you know work with autistic children, or you are aware of what that term tactically defensive means, is that, uh, or if you've been a, a traumatized or ever attacked, that being touched suddenly uh, is very threatening. And so discretion is needed in dealing with that. You assume that you do not immediately go run up to a woman who has had her breast removed and give her a big hug. She needs to physically reconnect to her body and to other people. And sometimes that means to a husband, to her children, but first to herself. She's been through all the treatments, and she's seeking an alternative therapy. And there is very little out there, from my own experience, of alternative therapy. Uh, you can go to a spa. Uh, you can, you know, get a hairdo. But in terms of real therapy, um, I didn't find it. And I have, you know, I, I don't find it. And so I don't think it's there. And this woman is weakened. She may have trouble breathing because often uh, the radiation 
to the chest will impact the lungs, as it did in my own case, where a lung will collapse, as it did in my own case, and uh, left me in a wheelchair. I couldn't walk because I couldn't breathe. And if she's been um, disabled for a long time, or even a month or several months, she's going to have trouble supporting her own weight, which means climbing on a big, you know, 16-hand horse is not an option. And I'm also assuming that this can be applied to any woman given a certain weight limit. Um, she doesn't need to know how to ride a horse. She doesn't have to have ever been on a horse. And um, this, the examples that are going to follow will be of a woman who doesn't know how to ride a horse. Now, I'm assuming about the horse, for those of you who have to select what kind of a horse to use. Based on the assumption that the woman's legs are weak, that she may not even be able to support her own weight, unless you have a ramp, a mounting ramp, or some big strong men in your program to lift that woman on and off that horse, uh, I think a horse no taller than 14 hands is the ideal. I'm saying here the horse has beauty. And, I, and is comfortable and round and can carry up to 150 pounds. A horse that can't carry 150 pounds isn't strong enough for this. Why beauty? Because beauty has been lost in the eyes often of the world or of the woman herself. Even if she's very beautiful, she doesn't feel very beautiful. And connecting with this beautiful animal is psychologically um, inspiring exciting. The horse is not in pain and he's been trained to stand square on command and breathe in time with the equine specialist, that is the leader, at a mounting block or a ramp. And it's very important that whoever handles this horse is in touch with the way the horse is breathing because that breathing is going to be transferred to the woman whose ability to breathe may have been impaired, either by anxiety or damage to her lungs. Okay, The horse is not easily distracted. It leads well and can move rhythmically to music. And I have found that if you take the time, every horse that I have tried to work with to music has an ear for music. And if the person leading is listening and, and walking in time to the music, the horse will too. Um, okay, these are the assumptions. Now, about the equipment, because the opening of the hips to mount a horse, the lifting of the leg is something that one, you know, gets from a, you know, for practice, from doing it, I think it's necessary to have a padded vaulting barrel with handles to practice the positions of before mounting the horse. And when I say the positions, I mean the getting on, the sitting sideways, lifting the leg over the horse's neck, the sitting backwards, uh, in order to be able, as if you could see this picture, to lie down backwards. This is the back of the barrel, and this is a volunteer, a young lady volunteer who is learning. She's never done this before. She's never ridden a horse, but she, she wanted to learn about this, so she came to an orientation. And this is an adjustable mounting, uh, uh, vaulting barrel that I ordered especially so that I can adjust it to the height of the horse that's going to be mounted. In this case, this lovely horse down below, the white horse, this is a 30-year-old Arab horse, uh, former trail um, string horse, uh, 13 two hands, which w is uh, an easy way to mount, but very round and also very beautiful fairy tale looking horse and very gentle horse. Um, you need a round pin or a small arena, and it should be level um, because balancing on the horse in these exercises is very important. Sunscreen and insect repellent for people on the horse is very important because this horse is going to have to stand like a statue for that woman to lie down, as well. you'll see in coming slides. You don't want it uh, being bitten by bees, flies, or having to shift its weight or want to rub its nose. You want to make sure the horse is clean and well prepared and covered with uh, fly spray. And 
the woman who may be still um, on s drug therapy is going to need, you know, sunscreen because she's going to be hypersensitive to UV. Then uh, for the later stages of the, tr of the therapy, I'm going to pr propose you need a boom box with a working CD player, a battery operated or power outlet powers better, batteries fail. And you need a barrel or a stand for the music, the boom box, and you need lots of water because hydration is essential. The patient, um, first of all, she's nervous. She's going to be, you know, uh, be anxious. And um, she is going to need to be hydrated to and have the endurance to withstand the treatment. And then the last uh, uh, item that is a special item is an oximeter to measure oxygen and heart rate, which is that little thing that you put your finger in and when you go to the hospital, when they, you know, they check your vital signs, you can find out a lot about the condition of the person who's come to you, whether they know it or not, simply by putting that on taking a reading. You can also take that reading during the exercise to see how they're doing, and you can also take it at the end to see what the effect of what you've done is, which is what I did and which how I discovered that this exercise that I'm going to uh, show you actually made a huge difference in my heart rate and my oxygen, blood oxygen. So here it is. That is a picture of me in 2008, having lost the use of my lungs. Um, I, you see me here where I'm, uh, I have uh, oxygen tubes in my nose to breathe. There's the adjustable vaulting barrel. We're going to use the thick vaulting pad and the vaulting surf single for learning how to move before we ever get on a horse. And the oximeter, where it's, you know, I'm saying the patient is wearing, in my case, I wore it in a pouch around my neck. And uh, the therapist will read the pulse and the oxygen saturation before and after the session. And that's an oximeter. The normal reading, and I don't know if you can see it, says 77 over 98. That's the normal reading. So here I am, and my reading before I did the exercise I'm going to show you was a heart rate of 125 and an oxygen saturation of 78. So a heart rate of 20, 125 is the heart is pounding and uh, there's just enough oxygen in the blood to barely, you know, be conscious. And uh, I needed the oxygen tank, you know, to, to regulate that. So, reading the oximeter before and after. Um, so here I am on the pony, if you could see her. And here is uh, my helper, who is a uh, physician's assistant and a horsewoman, a friend of mine. And she came over uh, to help me do this experiment where she read the reading before I, I uh, lay down on the horse, which is the exercise, at 125 and 78 low blood oxygen. And I asked her what would that mean, and she, she would say, well, you, you know, dizzy and, and weak. Uh, then we did the exercise, and the picture down below is our reading it 60 seconds later uh, with a normal heart rate and a 90% blood oxygen. And that was the beginning of this whole program, which is not just the outside of a horse is good for the inside of a man, but actual uh, changing of what is going on in the body. It's not uh, theoretical, it's real. Okay, now assumptions, the environment uh, I think the environment should be free of spectators, noise, or distractions. So you're not going to have a session for a breast cancer patient in the middle of uh, a horse show or uh, children having riding lessons or a lot of people watching because discretion is uh, important. Uh, we're going to use music. Music will come into play here, and so it needs to be quiet enough to hear and concentrate on the music because the horse has to hear it, the leaders have to hear it, and the, uh, the patient has to hear it because the patient is going to be using music that she chose that has meaning to her. 
Um, no children, adults only, except for the volunteers. You know, if there are young women in, uh, in as trained volunteers, yes. Separate from and out of view of other riding activities, and if you have it, um, you you're the envy of all of us. Ideally, under shade of cover, if possible, in a covered arena or some kind of shade, because especially in the summertime. The medications that are in the system can cause UV hypersensitivity, and there's a there's a, a, a danger of uh, dehydration and heat stroke as well as um, loss of balance. Okay, now how do we prepare the horse? A horse has to be stand, trained to stand square. Of course, if you're running a therape uh, therapeutic riding program, you have trained your horses to stand square for the mount. And the horse has to be trained to accept all the body positions, and he needs to be trained by the volunteers, able-bodied volunteers, so that he is not surprised by somebody turning around and lying down backwards on him. Uh, the volunteers need to experience the positions themselves on the barrel, and they need to learn how to do a, a safe dismount assist from the barrel, and then practice the positions on the horse after that. So here is my uh, specially ordered adjustable height portable vaulting barrel and there I am uh, showing in our first orientation where we're headed, how, where, what the position is that we're going to get to on the horse. And here are the volunteers practicing on the barrel practicing the positions of, you know, getting from forward uh, seat to, to backwards, and then practicing the dismount, which if you know how to do a dismount, you know this volunteer is not doing correctly yet. She's holding on to the leg instead of using her forearms. But this is um, where we sit, begin to train. And here we are, the volunteers are practicing the positions on the horse where they're actually experiencing something that no, even though they may be riders, they may have never experienced. I mean, who lies down with their head towards the tail with their arms hanging down the back of the horse? And then here, you know, is the correct way to do the dismount from the horse. Now the client. It may not be the case with everyone who comes, but it may be the case with some, especially if the client is older. Um, the range of motion in both the arms and the legs is likely to be constricted. And so the client should be introduced to the positions first on the barrel to loosen up the joints. That is, even once you, you've actually started working with the horse, with the client on the horse, before they get on the horse, they should get on the barrel to make sure that they don't have cramps, that when they lift their leg over, they're not going to get a you know a cramp in the hip, which happens. It's very very common, and um, that will you know just doing it on the barrel will loosen them up so that they can move uh, more freely on the, when they get on the horse. Uh, the hip joints are you know a major problem, so to prevent the cramping, the mounting barrel should um, be at the height of 56 inches or less. And the steps to the barrel should be at least 18 inches high, not the two-step, but the three-step. And I'm assuming that you're using a 14-hand horse, so that the leg doesn't have to be lifted really high to get up on a big horse, with, with unless you have a, a ramp or a platform, as you would for a non-ambulatory patient for putting the person down on the horse instead of having to lift up onto the horse. OK, now here are the four principles of what we're doing. We're re, first one, resensitizing the person through touch. And why do I say resensitizing? Because I think the person is likely to be numb from the trauma that she's been through. And so starting it through touch to resensitize her. The second thing we're going to do is activate the vagus nerve. And you may not know what that means, although in the last presentation, um, the lady who spoke about autism happened to mention in passing that they have, are coming up with uh, an idea that the vagus nerve is um, that the rocking of the horse has something to do with the vagus nerve, which calms, can calm and regulate 
the erratic uh, reactions of an autistic person. I'm going to go into this very specifically. It won't be just, you know, riding a horse, but I'll go into very specifically what this does. Synchronized breathing, that means the patient lying in the position that I, you've seen already is breathing at the same rate as the horse. And synchronized movement to music means that the music that the woman has selected that has meaning to her will be become the music of the horse and the music of the helpers, that is the sidewalkers and the leader and the instructor. And all will attempt to, um, to achieve a harmony in movement to that specific music. And those are the four principles. Okay, number one, resensitize the person through touch. So first, the client, and in this case, I want to tell you a little story about this young lady. She um, hasn't had a, a surgery yet, but she w was in uh, the late stages of her chemotherapy when she first came to meet Shalom, and this is Shalom, the horse, the 30-year-old horse who was a rescue horse. He was rescued from slaughter uh, before he came here. And um, I suggested that she come over and meet me. Uh, she didn't tell me anything about herself. She didn't tell me where she had been, but she was desperately looking for an alternative therapy to, um, to try to um, hopefully get a remission from the tumor that was being treated with uh, the chemotherapy. So when she came here, I took her into the stall with this white horse, and I told her, let him smell you. He'll put it your hand. You know, horses like to smell. That's how they greet each other. She didn't know anything about that. And when she held out her hand to him, he th drew his head away and turned away in revulsion. And she said, oh, he doesn't like me. And I said, wait a minute, um, I, I, he has no reason not to like you. Tell me more. He has sensed something. He knows something about you that you haven't told me. Let's, you know, let's see what it is. Where, what's your experience with horses? And she said, well, the last time I was on a horse, I was eight years old. The horse ran away with me, and I was terrified, and I had to be rescued. And uh, I haven't been on a horse since. And I said, oh, and uh, where were you before you came? And she said, I just came from my chemotherapy treatment. So that's why in my introduction I said, horses smell chemotherapy as well as fear. And that horse re was smelling both fear and chemotherapy. As soon as she said that, the horse looked back at her very intently, and he bowed to her. He bowed his head to her. And she said, what does this mean? And I said, what this means is that you have explained yourself to me and to him. He accepts that, those, that situation, and he's offering himself to you. Now give him your hand again and see what happens. And he, she did, and he, he, he stayed close to her, and he just stayed with his head in a similar position to what you're looking at right here. And I said, okay, so the offer has been made, and now it's up to you to decide whether you want to accept it. We're ready for you. Okay, so um, she, we went ahead, and she came. Okay, so now the method, touch. First, we begin with grooming. Um, I don't know if those of you who have programs, have your clients involved in the grooming of the horses, but that's a, that is a definite part of what we're doing here where the client is actually, she is touching the horse, resensitizing herself through the touch. But more important than the, the grooming, it doesn't matter how well she cleans the horse, because of course we, you know, we who work in the barn are going to do that well ourselves. It's empowerment. This woman has been acted upon. She's had her breast cut off. She's been terrified. I'm going to die. She has been given chemotherapy. She's lost her hair. She's been given radiation. She's probably, you know, if she went, went to work, she's definitely a hero. Um, and she doesn't really feel comfortable about being touched because all this touching has been damaging. Um, and and, and, she, and it, you know, one is really quite helpless while it's going on. So the idea is that she is doing the touching on her terms. 
empowerment. Then grooming the horse, why is this important? Because we need to desensitize, and this is a tricky word, but basically, uh, you know, get the horse used to the idea of this person who smells like this, who acts like this, who feels like this, to reduce his own reactivity, his own fear. And the example, of course, is the one I've already given you. The horse is going to spell, smell chemicals, poisons, in the client's skin. And so the horse has to be able to accept that and will because we know what, what they are. They're very generous. And we need to heighten the horse's awareness of the client's energy level and to create an energy field between the two of them. And this grooming interaction is a building of trust between the two individuals, the horse and the woman. To create an energy field between the horse and the client. So the client and the horse are overcoming fear on the ground before there's ever any mounting. And here's an example of what that looks like. Okay, first principle, resensitize and stabilize the client. The two types of touch I've talked about, touching with the hand, and that involves skin to skin contact, the woman's skin uh, with the horse's skin. And skin to skin contact is a specific term which is used in pediatrics um, of when a, pre a child is born prematurely and is not uh, regulating its its um, respiration or its heart, heartbeat, um, it, it has been found that laying the child, and if you see this uh, diagram here, skin to skin contact, laying the child on the mother's chest, where the child can, through the skin, the nerves in the skin, feel um, the, not, the respiration, feel the rhythm of it, feel the heart beat, and also get a stimulus through the nerves in the skin to the underdeveloped uh, brain of the premature baby, that this is sometimes as effective as uh, an incubator. That uh, very quickly they can, you know, the, the regulation happens even in the pre premature child. So this is something that I discovered by accident, by lying down on my horse in the position to the right. And that was the body-to-body -body touch. In the pediatrics, they call it KMC, kangaroo mother care treatment, which will regulate the heart rate and the breathing of the premature infant. In this case, the body damaged and modified by the breast cancer treatment needs the same kind of re-regulation and modification. And that can, is happening. So in this case, this position on the horse, the horse is like the mother in KMC. And then now I'm going to tell you in more detail how does that work. Okay, so first of all, we have, this is a volunteer. She's in the backwards position on the horse for the first time, which is um, a neurological reorientation just from the position alone. One doesn't sit backwards on a horse. So that already is, is affecting uh, her, her sensibilities. And then when she lies down and touches the back of the horse, and that's why you want a nice round horse with a beautiful rear end, that she can stroke that and feel that she's getting the skin-to-skin -skin contact. And beyond that, oh, now here we are with the young woman who came to me who had never been on a horse, who was afraid of a horse. The first time she's on the horse and she's feeling the skin and also, I'm going to uh, alert her to where the hip bones are because she's going to be doing a push-up after lying her chest down on the back of the horse, so she needs to know where the hip bones are so she can do that push-up. Full body contact between the client and the horse allows for vagus nerve stimulation and alignment of the physical rhythms of the breath and the heartbeat. Principle one. And here is an interesting uh, picture. I guess I better hurry because time is, is going. Um, this is one of my favorite artists, and this is one of my favorite pictures. And uh, I wanted to use this picture, so I found him. He lives in Las Vegas. And he had done this picture, and I said, I love this picture, and it expresses what it is I experienced and want to teach. 
and can I use it in my uh, literature? And he said, yes, of course you can. He gave me permission uh, for the copyright. And I asked him, how did you happen to get, you know, get this red woman and the red, the pink on the horse? And he said, it was an accident. I wanted the woman red, and when they did the printing, the printing bled and bled into the horse. But actually what we're seeing here is the exchange of heat from body to body. And that is going to happen here with the full body contact. Okay, now, where are the points of contact? The diaphragm, we all know where that is, uh, is, I don't know if you can see what I'm doing with my arrow, but the diaphragm is contacted with, uh, the, if you follow the shape of the back of the horse up the croup, then there, the body is going to mold to that shape. So the stomach will be, you know, in the hollow of the back, and then the diaphragm will be pressed upon. And in the center of the chest is the vagus nerve, which I showed you on the slide back there with the, uh, the mother, the kangaroo contact with the X in the middle of her chest. That's where the nexus of the vagus nerve is, where it contacts the lungs and the heart. And you see the X here. And the rib cage, of course, is touching, and the shoulder, the inside of the shoulder, the inner arm, and the cheek. These are all points of contact between the, wo the woman and the horse. Normally, when you ride, you have your seat on the horse. That's it. But here you have your whole upper body impacted. OK, activating the vagus nerve. There is that kangaroo mother care. And here is where the vagus nerve is, right in the middle of the chest. And the functions of the vagus nerve are that it automatically regulates the stability, uh, medically called homeostasis, of all the vital internal organs, the viscera they're called. And it regulates the heart rate, the respiratory rate, the body temperature, it controls inflammation. Um, it directly uh, impacts the heart rate, the respiratory rate, the digestive tract function, and muscle relaxation. And indirectly, it calms the nervous system, reducing stress and anxiety, establishes an internal rate and rhythm, increases ox oxygenation, killing off free radicals, which are cancer causers, enhances metabolism, and heightens a sense of self-awareness and groundedness. So these are the possible benefits of activating that vagus nerve. Now why is, okay, here, here is another picture of where it comes from. It starts in the brain. You see the yellow? And if you follow the yellow down to that red box in the middle, that's where it comes from either side of the brain. Down into the center there, you see the lungs. It goes to the lungs and it goes to the heart. It's like a thermostat. It takes a reading of how all of these organs are functioning, sends it back to the brain, and, and regulates all of these things. I hope that's clear. And uh, it also affects, you know, one of the side effects of all the drugs is uh, constipation, nausea, et cetera, et cetera. And um, activating the vagus nerve can help regulate that as well. Okay, <clears throat> now we have the two kinds of nervous system. We have a p the vagus nerve controls the parasympathetic nervous system. What is that? That's automatic. We don't think about it. But we also have another kind of nervous system that's a sympathetic, reactive nervous system. So that if we, you know, we touch something hot and it's burning us, we react. If we're in danger, we react. If we're in war, we react. And what happens is adrenaline starts pumping, the heart races, the brain shuts down, and we f fight or flee. That's the sympathetic nervous system. And um, the reason we want to activate the vagus nerve, and why would it not be activated? Because the person has PTSD. They've been traumatized. So their adrenaline is pumping, and they are afraid, and they are anxious. And so we want to stop that. We want to switch it off. And that's what the vagus nerve, the activation of it, is supposed to do. So here we have the two nervous systems. Parasympathetic controls the fight-flight reaction. It pumps adrenaline. It speeds up the heart rate. It puts the body on high alert. It responds to fear, danger, or shock. The parasympathetic re regulates the stability of the internal organs for rest and healing, suppresses adrenaline, allows the heart rate, and slows the heart rate, and regulates the breathing, which is why 
my experiment, well, my, ins you know, my, it was an experiment. It was my last ditch effort to try to do something for myself of lying on my pony and giving her a big hug caused those readings to change so drastically. Vagus nerve stimulation through body, body, body to body contact um, is designed to switch the parasympathetic to this parasympathetic nervous system to synchronize the client and horse, the clients and the horse's rate of respiration and heart rate to re the release of tension in the muscles to relaxation and increase the oxygen intake and, and saturation of oxygen in the blood. Okay, now we're in principle three, synchronized breathing. A client who is stressed from treatment breathes through the upper chest, taking shallow breaths, like panting. It's called, this is called clavicular breathing, where we actually lift up our shoulders and try and you know and and breathe just and if you s remember that picture of me sitting on the horse looking at the oximeter I, my shoulders were very high because i was breathing that way shallow breathing can result or be symp symptomatic of hyperventilation it can also be caused by anxiety or even the radiation damage to the lungs where the lungs are not f functioning fully so the purpose of synchronized breathing is to change clavicular, that's high chest breathing, to abdominal breathing in order to bring needed oxygen to the brain and the muscles. And this is not only going to affect the ability to heal, it's going to impact, in, uh, impact on posture because the, this uh, uh, raising of the shoulders to breathe, you know, to pant like this, can, can cause permanent change in a woman's posture. And it's, you know, if you see people who are, you know, are very anxious or very ill, that's the way they breathe, that's the way they look, and sometimes their bodies take that shape. Okay, now pressure and release of the diaphragm. I showed you the picture of the contour of the horse and how the body presses um, on the dia uh, the diaphragm is pressed into the croup. It activates the, di the nerves on the diaphragm as well, it act as well as activating the, nerve, the vagus nerve in the chest. When the client pushes back into the upright position, releasing this pressure, the diaphragm will drop, allowing the air to rush deep into the lungs and help to promote abdominal breathing. If the client is told to relax and drop her shoulders, open her mouth, and allow the air to be expelled from her lungs, this will expel carbon dioxide and toxins, which you know are rampant in the body. Energy and euphoria result as the brain receives more oxygen, and energy is han enhanced from synchronization with the horse's healthy breathing rhythm. Okay, pressure on the diaphragm, you can see where it is. If you, I hope you can see the white arrows that I pro, uh, provided. And uh, how do we do it? Method for synchronized breathing. First of all, the horse has to be breathing. This is a strange uh, um, procedure that we're going through for the horse, and that's why we want to do it a lot with the volunteers. The horse has to be breathing. He can't be holding his breath while the client is up there, you know, moving around to face backwards. So that that's up to the leader. The leader has to breathe for the horse, breathe with the horse. B, have a Zen connection to the horse so that when the client is lying down, she can feel the barrel of the horse where the lungs are opening and closing, expanding and contracting. And the client's calves are hanging down next to where the lungs are on the horse, right, where the ribcage is. And uh, she needs to have her attention drawn to that so that she can move through, feel through her calves as the horse's lungs go out and in, that she breathes in when they go out and breathes out when they go in and synchronize her breasts with the movement and expansion, expansion and contraction of the horse's sides. Okay, and now you can see a picture of where are these, the lower body contacts. The calves are next to the lungs of the horse. The heels are next to the horse's heart. And um, the thighs are being warmed by the horse's back. 
Okay, synchronized breathing through the legs. The client feels the movement of the horse's breathing through her calves, and it takes about 60 seconds, the time it took to change my readings as we began, to get this in rhythm. It doesn't happen right away. It, you know, you have to take the time. And 60 seconds is a long time for a horse to stand very still, square. So that's, I would say, the maximum that you should do this. This therapy is actually takes 60 seconds. It takes a lot of work to make it possible, but it only takes 60 seconds for this to happen. And the client will stroke the haunch of the horse as she breathes with the horse to have a rhythm for her breathing and also through, to enhance the skin contact at the same time. Now here you see a picture of what happens. When the client pushes up on the hip bone, sits upright, the diaphragm is going to drop, the lungs are going to fill with air, the shoulders fall back, she's um, encouraged to blow out the toxins, she can even yell when she does it, drop her shoulders, relax, sink deep into the horse, and start breathing deeper. And how does she look after she does that? Well, you can see here, she's now in the forward position, she's relaxed, and you can see from the look at her on her face, the euphoria. The, you know, what has happened to her, her brain as a result of this. Okay, now getting off is another uh, issue. Um, she's had oxygen rushing to her brain and uh, she, um, she may be uh, a little rocky when she, if, when she hits the ground, but um, the dismount is an opportunity to con cause even more body-to-body -body contact to take place. Unless, you know, in the case of the young lady in these pictures, she had a hole in her chest from we were putting chemotherapy in from her chest. So we had to be careful about that so as, you know, as not to irritate it. But um, we, she managed to do it. We just, you know, we did it in such a way so that we didn't rub on that place. And she was encouraged to slide down Rather than pushing off and away from the horse when you take a horse off, uh, client off the horse, she was encouraged to slide down and stay there, lean into the horse, and then hold that position as she regains her balance on her feet. She's taking in more oxygen and she needs a moment to settle. And here's a picture of that taking place. And then the client is encouraged to stay close and spend a moment with the horse after the dismount. We don't start talking amongst ourselves right away. Something very intimate has happened here, the sharing of these two bodies. And the client needs to communicate with the horse and they can breathe together and bond together at this same time. This is the kind of contact that being tactically defensive and traumatized is not easily accessible to her and here is her chance to enjoy it. Okay, principle four. Synchronize, synchronize, are we still on? I see a nose here, suddenly timed out. Okay, all right. Uh, synchronized movement to music. Okay, what's it for? Physical and emotional integration. And the mu music has to speak to the client. It has to be a love song, a moment of happiness, a moment of joy, something that, that has meaning to her. It has to um, be um, have a harmonious and synchronized group rhythm where the client, the volunteer, and the team, and they can all move together to it. The client will create an emotional memory inspired by this music and the experience that she's having to it to carry her through later. And it, the music will allow the team to share in her emotion as she gives her pain over to the horse who carries her towards her rehabilitation without her having to talk about it. Okay, purpose of the movement is not to teach independent riding or move faster than a walk. The objective is to loosen the pelvis, to move in rhythm with the horse to a specific beat. The client that breathes with that rhythm as her pelvis follows the horse's movement. And now I'm gonna show you how that looks. Oh, here's something about the music. It has to, you know, it should have four beats, you know, a walking rhythm. It should not be high pitched in a lower total range. The tempo should not be too fast, easy to follow at a slow walk. Percussion is helpful, like in belly dance music. Uh, new age meditation, hard rock, heavy metal uh, may lack a strong enough beat or agitate the horse, making group synchronization too hard.
romantic theme is desirable, vocals are okay, especially if they have meaning like lean on me, natural woman, wind beneath my wings, these are all emotional. Um, a big orchestral number is Beethoven's, you know, Fifth Symphony, not a good idea. The horse should be rehearsed with the music to gauge his reaction to the pitch. Okay, now, influence of music on the horse. Horses do respond to the energy and speed of music. The music can also be used to cue the starts and the stops in the movement. Someone should be assigned to control the CD player. The instructor cues the music with a thumbs up or down. Volume can then be decreased to a count of three, one, two, three, four being the woe to prepare the horse and the leader for a very smooth halt. Music should not be played during instructions or discussion. Don't talk while the music is playing. It takes full concentration to move in rhythm with music. And I suggest a power chord because I've had too many batteries fail on me right in the middle of a moving piece of music. So make sure the music keeps playing. All right. Now the riding positions on the horse for the breast cancer patient. I suggest a loose cotton loop rein, clip to uh, a halter, no bits. Uh, the uh, the uh, patient is taught to give from the elbow. The, the horse is on a lead line. She, he doesn't have to be controlled by the rider. The rider, uh, second one, rides with her hands on her hips. She drops the reins to feel her pelvis moving. Uh, to, to try to synchronize with the horse's pelvis moving. The rider drops her hands to her sides and shoulders, lengthens her leg, and concentrates on deep abdominal breathing along with the pelvis. And here are pictures of that. The client rides on a loose rein, and to the right is the relationship pelvis to pelvis. Uh, second step. Client puts her hands on her hips, and these pictures were taken from a film where the music was playing, and she can feel the roll of her pelvis with the hands on her hips as she opens her mouth and breathes in rhythm with the movement. Her shoulders, in this particular case, are still up. There's still some tension, so I've asked her to drop her arms and let go. Just go with the flow. And you can see what happened to the horse. As soon as she did that, how the horse's head drops and how loose he gets. And at the end of the session, I suggest that the client should lead, now this, this is at the end of a fourth session, actually lead, keep the music playing and the, horse will, the client will walk with her horse to her music. And uh, they've shared their bodies, they've shared their emotion, they've shared their movement. And, to get, and what happens here in this picture is that they're actually in a bubble. They're breathing in synchronization, moving, and the horse, she doesn't know anything about leading a horse, but this horse will follow her even if she doesn't know how to lead a horse because she has, you know, been in harmony with him. Okay, now what do the leader and sidewalkers do? I, do we, I have a couple of minutes left, okay. Uh, the leader has a loose lead, walking in step alongside the horse's head, not in front, not dragging, not behind pulling, giving the horse room to move his head naturally. Sidewalkers walk in step with the leader to reinforce the horse's rhythm. You can't daydream while you do this. All should be stepping forward on the same foot, right or left, at the same time with the beat. And how does it look when it's done right? That's how it looks. If you look at the legs, the horse's leg forward, the leader's leg forward, the sidewalker's leg forward, and the rider's in perfect balance. Now, how does it look when it's not done correctly? Well, we had a, a man show up who took charge, <laughs> and it didn't work out too well. He grabbed the reins. The horse didn't know what to do. Everybody's out of step. That's not the way we want to do it. Here we are again, how we do want to do it. Um, this is harmony, and this is what we're looking for, harmony. And again, the incorrect, and of course, he needs a lead line. He should not be pulling on the rein. You can see the, per the ladies falling off the horse and the volunteers are lost. Okay, here he's getting it a little bit better, but yeah, you've seen what it should look like. Okay, now I don't have time to go into all of this, but okay, Kristen left us, I'm sorry. If you want to download this, here is a step-by-step -step of what you can or I think you should do for sessions one, two, three, and four, and you can follow this. 
And um, I think in ongoing after this, then it's a matter of building strength, building friendships, building bonding, building mentoring. But I think there should always be the lying down prone portion for five, no more than five minutes before anything beyond that. And if you want to see this in motion, here is where you can see it on YouTube, face by face, or on my website, Green Rider. Uh, Quest. There are three videos there, and you can actually see it happening. And then the last issue is bonding. Can the horse touch the client? And if yes, how much and when? If the first principle was for the client to be able to act, not be acted upon, when can the horse express himself? When the, can the horse touch? And how does the horse, who has absorbed so much pain and accepted such intimate contact, express what he has shared with the client? A horse has feelings too, and here you can see Shalom, after a session, expressing himself with that lady who was in the earlier slides. And I allow this to happen. I know some of us think we shouldn't let the horses, you know, touch the client, but they, I, I allow this to happen. And this is the bonding where the horse thanks the client for recognizing what he has to offer. And how does the horse get re rid of the pain that he's absorbed? He rolls it away, and I think it's a good thing to let the client see that, to know that this too will pass. And now we're talking about the precautions, which I'll let you read about. And I think you should try to get a physician's release, which will not be easy to get. And um, the precautions are listed here. I don't know if I have time to go through them. Do I, Jenny? I'll, I'll, I'll quickly mention a few. Osteoporosis is caused by anti-estrogen hormone drug treatments. And there they're listed. Uh, you should not work over in temperatures over 80 degrees because you can put the client at risk for heat stroke. Uh, watch out for the cramping of the hips and uh, alleviate by practicing on a barrel. Be uh, sensitive to tactile defensiveness. Avoid hugging people unless they reach out for you. The PTSD can cause an anxiety attack. There will be impaired vision, dizziness, or imbalance due to pain medications or side effects of anti-estrogens. You need to be aware of that. There could be open sores from chemo ports or in the arm or the chest or surgical scars not yet healed, and there could be burning from radiation on the chest sensitive to the touch. So you could say, well, in that case, let's not do it. But I'm saying, in that case, let's do it. Um, here are two famous women who died of breast cancer, young, without the benefit of this therapy. Moira Harris wrote 10 books about horses, died in 2009. I got this set picture sent to me by her sister in her memory who made a donation. She didn't get equine facilitated therapy. Barbara Glasgow, the grandmother of hippotherapy, died of breast cancer, 2009 at the age of 55. She invented this but she didn't get it for herself. I am doing this presentation because I think we should do this. I think we can do it. It's not a disability. It's not listed. Nor is it always terminal, but it can be disabling. One in every eight women will suffer from it. There's no rehabilitation currently available. The horse can help. PATH can do this. I think we can do this. And I thank you for watching. Um, is, is, can I answer any questions or are we off the air?